I'd like to introduce the next moderator for the topic that we have to start the afternoon, Trey Cates, who's the COO of Savory Institute. He's also the architect behind all of the hubs that I was mentioning, which are already at 20 and are going to be expanding year after year. He's also the architect of a technological platform that's looking to share the benefits of holistic management with the world over. Trey. Let's have a few of the hubs I have selected to come up here and have a seat on the stage. We're going to be talking in conversation with one another. Just come on up here, Jorgen. Huggins, Jose Manuel, and Yvonne, please. So we have four hubs here that are represented uh, from four different regions of the world. One in Sweden, one in Zimbabwe, one in Chile and uh, one in Mexico. Before we start engaging in the conversation, I wanted to start off by just giving you a little background on the strategy and where it came from and why we are doing what we're doing in reference to the hubs. The purpose really came from the vision that was established from the Savory Institute several years ago, which was all about large-scale restoration. And that large-scale restoration was embedded in the idea that we wanted to empower local people to take up arms as such and, and use that as a means to influence, support, and continue to create real impact on the ground in these regions. That real impact on the ground, we wanted it to be owned uh, in that region. We did not want it to be something inputted or uh, stimulated from the Savory Institute. We wanted to engage in what we would call really strategic partnerships. And those strategic partnerships are more about a conversation than they are about some kind of financial transaction. And, and it was really about what we could do to build long-term very relational, engaging conversations with individuals that are desiring to see true impact on the ground with their neighbors, with their communities, in their context. And there are many different ways that we could go about doing that, but we knew just setting up offices globally was not going to be the answer. And so after interviewing and spending time with lots and lots of people, we realized the opportunity to create real scale the opportunity to create real impact was just engaging in these partnerships. And so sometimes, because places are different in different regions around the world, what we do in Mexico, what we do in Sweden, what we do in other different places around the world will be different because what we're really wanting to see is real impact on the ground. But at the same time, there is a core, a core consistency and quality to what holistic management is doing across all these regions and what the Savory Institute is supporting in all these regions that we want to have consistency across all of that. And so it's been an honor uh, to be a part of this in that these guys right here were in essence as it's been called within the, the Savory Institute the guinea pigs of this process uh, and, and, and that is just working with us in conversation about so what does it look like to be in relationship with a completely separate organization in a very different place where we're trying to inform a process, inform something that we truly believe, as Alan said, as Daniela said, as many of the speakers have said, that is truly regenerative in all that it does and everything that it's trying to accomplish. How do we build that kind of long-term lasting relationship in a way that is financially sustainable, <clears throat> that's ecologically regenerative, and it's socially responsible? And that is what the Savory Institute is about. And that's where the strategy really is based in those values and in that intent. And when we think about those things, that is why we really want to move from just talking about it in terms of, so what are we doing uh, in the details, and then get to having a conversation, which is what we'll sit down and do, about what this looks like. Long term, the goal, 2025, is for us to have 100 partners a hundred savory hubs, and those hubs are not identified as savory hubs. They'll be Ovis Ventiuno uh, in, uh, in Argentina, or it will be uh, the uh, Scandinavian uh, group in Sweden. Uh, they will have their own identities. They will have their own local contexts. 
Uh, they will only utilize Savory Institute as a tool, as a means to help impact that region. So with all of that being said, we're going to start having this conversation. So thank you guys for coming up here today. So am I, I know I'm here. Great. So what we want to start was just getting to know each person first. And so as a result of that, I want to hear what, what was the very first thing, and we'll start with you, Yvonne. What, how were you introduced to holistic management? And uh, as a result, uh, what kind of impact has that made on you personally in your life? All right. Thank you, Trey. Uh, thanks, everyone. Well, we first encountered holistic management back in the late 70s, early 80s, when Alan, Mr. Savory, called it the Savory Gracing Method uh, in West Texas and Angelo in that area. Uh, we began our re-education in the mid-80s with Alan and the first generation of educators that were produced in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Ever since then, and by realizing that biodiversity, water, and air are common global assets, we have gone our, out of our fence lines. Uh, I'm a producer, I'm a rancher, and we have gone uh, uh, out of our fence lines in order to transmit the message that there is an alternative way, the alternative up to the present moment to revert this degrading tendency that had been impoverishing and it's <clears throat> impoverishing lots of our communities. Now, years later, and with hundreds of people that have been touched by holistic management through our work, and with the support of this fabulous network, there is a more hope than ever before. Thank you, Yvonne. Huggins. Huggins was uh, part of the Africa Center, which was one of the first hubs and actually has been around for years. And in 2012, he became official hub as a part of the network for the Savory <coughs> Institute. So tell us a little bit about your journey, Huggins. Uh, first of all, uh, everyone might want to know that my real background, I'm in accounting by profession. So how I ended up um, with holistic management, I used to sit at the back of the class when uh, the rest of uh, everyone were uh, learning that is the certified educators in holistic management. Until a lady, Linda Smazima, said there is much more to it than just sitting at the back of the class. The class that I loved the most was uh, the sessions on uh, holistic financial planning. So I said, okay, let me sit with the rest of the other sessions. So I started doing that until one day I asked Alan and Jody, uh, can I yeah, be formal in uh, attending uh, 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 these sessions? So I then registered, and uh, now I'm proud to say I went through the Certified Educator Program. Um, that was back there in 1998. Uh, after that, well, um, <coughs> I continued with the challenges in the communities. Uh, we work with 16 communities um, uh, with the Africa Center. Uh, of those uh, 16 communities, let me just give uh, some st statistics here. Uh, we cover about 72,000 hectares, uh, or put differently, 178,000 acres, with approximately targeting about 15,000 people um, in, the, in, the, in the region. So that's a sizable number of, um, of uh, communities. Um, when we started working with these communities, um, there was no immediate buy-in, especially with the community that was adjacent to the Africa Center and Yovo community. But when we then, with time, tried many different things to work, and then we introduced community action cycle, I'm proud to say we are starting to get uh, results, and good results for that matter, working with those uh, communities. I will recite later on some of uh, what we are, we are getting as a result. Mm. Thank you, Huggins. Jose Manuel, talk to, you, to us about what's going on in Chile and the community and how you were introduced to holistic management. Well, um, I, I'm a vet. I live in the 
southern part of Chile in Patagonia. And I have been working with CHIP uh, for 20 years. And we are part of OS21. We work with our friends from Argentina in the South African, so, sorry, South American network. So involved in all the chip industry, we, we hear something about the grass management from the Australian, our Australian friends. So it's maybe eight years ago, 10 years ago. So after that, I had the opportunity to travel to Australia. So I have a meet a work day or field day with Brian Marshall. So I saw in first view what is going on in an area very similar to some of the part of Chile. So uh, make me a lot of sense when I hear Brian. After that, I have the opportunity to have a course with Jim Howell. And after that, I start a very crazy study of holistic management. So after that, we get money from the government to have five uh, farms in a project. So we, we work with Brian and Pablo in a very good learning process. And so after that, I, I, I was very happy to find the way to finish with that conflict between the production and the ecology. Because I like the ecology and I like the production. I like the farming, I like the, the ecology. But always it's like a feeling guilty to be a farmer. So. Uh, for, uh, we have been very, very lucky working with many farmers there. Now we have maybe 500,000 hectares under holistic management there with big mobs, small farm, big farm. So, yeah, and in Chile now we have in, around the country from the north to the south new projects working with holistic management. So we're very happy because we, we see, we are seeing what's going on in the land and what, what's going on in the people. So to help, the possibility to help, to restore the land, to restore or give, the, give to the people hope and, and, and help in my country is a huge. So we are very happy to be part of this and we are very proud to be here in this room with all these people. Very good, thank you. We have the one representative European hub here. So Jorgen, tell us a little bit about your context. Okay. So. Uh, I come from, from, from the Nordic hub, and we have, I have the, the, I'm fortunate to, to be that close to London, so we have more, more people here. So I would actually ask my, my people to stand up so you can see that we have more people from Scandinavia right here. <laughs> oh, there they are. <laughs> and uh, we've been in the process for a bit more than five years, really, since, and there was, Ulf was one of them who's been very sort of skilled into this. And it was through the internet I got to know about this. People told me that I should look into this. Those, you know, you know those internet friends, you never meet them in, in real life, but they tell you what to do anyway. <laughs> and, really and it's been a, a tremendous journey. And it's been a lot like. So I'm a farmer from the beginning, and I always be interested in, in trying to understand how things, how things could be done better and, and all that. And after many years, just I mean, uh, I think my, my context of myself is being the feeling of being the, the lone nut, so to speak. <laughs> and coming into holistic management has been sort of a sense of coming home and coming into having, a, having this network of people. Yes. It's just amazing. It's just fantastic. Great. Thank you for all the introductions. Uh, the, the beauty of what you're hearing here, which has been an amazing part of uh, the conversation and the dialogue is they're all been somewhat or have been primarily a part of being practitioners and made the decision to move from just being a practitioner to wanting to teach and influencing their friends and their neighbors, which is what led them to wanting to be in the hub network. So in, in reference to that, can, can you guys share a story of what, what's been some of the greatest impact you've seen of holistic management in either your life or the life of those you've influenced? Why don't we start with Huggins, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, I, I said earlier that uh, we work with uh, 16 communities and I wanted just to say 
some of the significant changes that have started taking place since, um, I would say, 2012 uh, with the Wange communal lands. As we worked with communities, we started seeing change in forage for livestock uh, from, uh, well, two to eight percent times better in terms of uh, forage pro pro production. Uh, maize yields uh, about two to seven times greater uh, than the untreated uh, crop fields. Um, and then um, uh, we introduced mobile crows, which, which is um, a way uh, uh, we are using bomber sheeting, which is a big plastic sheet that becomes the crawl, and then we use it to impact uh, crop fields, gardens, uh, and uh, um, this is something that communities really love because uh, apart from giving those long-term results eventually that we are looking for um, in the rangelands, uh, immediately also it means they don't go begging for food. Okay, so, so these are some of the things that we are seeing. A, a tremendous reduction in bare ground, um, uh, reduced theft and the predation of livestock. Livestock overnight can be stolen in the crop, but when they put all their livestock together, there is better security. And uh, th these are some of the uh, uh, good things that the communities uh, are um, realizing. Uh, and then also improved livestock condition itself, uh, such that even the health of this livestock is better, we are now able to slaughter some animals um, uh, knowing that we've got sustainable um, uh, uh, beef um, with, with, with us. Um, so these are some of the benefits. In fact, what I will do later on, uh, or I can refer you to the website of the Africa Center because there is more on that website. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yvonne, you've had the opportunity to be you know, using holistic management since 75. You've got many examples you've personally shared with me. What's one that just stands out? Well, it's been since 1985 yeah. when I was first introduced by Gatsi and <coughs> Perez at a seminar in the capital city of Hermosillo uh, in Sonora. Uh, was at I can tell you this, but I'm a Mexican from uh, Hermosillo, Northwest state of Sonora, uh, a diversified rancher, second generation in the management of this uh, ranching state, a private commercial livestock, forestry, and rural tourism business. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, an example of someone of many who has been greatly impacted by the principles and practice of holistic management. Or oh, besides my offspring, my kids, which have grown up with these principles and this philosophy and practice of making a living out in the rural areas, which one of them is right here right now, Aurelio. Would you please stand up? Uh, uh, many people besides my, my kids have grown with this reality, thanks to Alan, Jody, and the rest of the gang. There are many more, many, many more, mainly ranchers, that have, been radically, have made radical changes in their operational decision making at ground level. But there is one, an old timer, a rancher from Baja California. His name is Don Ismael Yahweh. That in his late 70s, he's going to turn 80 in, in a few months, decided to redirect his way of managing his rangeland and livestock business. Him, three of his sons, and a couple of his cowboys that work with them have gone and completed the 16-day training program that we have available and offered to the community at large. 
at his age. He decided to learn and practice new ways. It is admirable for a man his age. Indeed, as I have mentioned to you before, there is a big possibility that him and his family might be candidates to commit and lead a future hub in that part of the world, in Baja California. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jose Manuel. <clears throat> well, um, well, since we start working uh, with this, yes, we, we are very happy that we help many farmers uh, to be more sustainable, to increase the current capacity. We have some example in, well, one little bit small farm for that area, that in five years increased the current capacity, uh, doubled the current capacity, and at the same time he, he doubled the income per head, so now they have one farm uh, which normally have 1,000 and a half uh, sheep with almost five, uh, sorry, 1,000 and a half, and now it's almost 5,000 sheep in mother and, and hoggets, and getting double more money for the head. So there are many examples of people that increase in 20% the, the stocking rate per year. So, But if I had to give an example of huge result of holistic management, uh, when we have the training, we the, when we have a training and when we work with families or farmers, the first, thing, the first thing that we did is, what we do, sorry, is the, the holistic context, where the people have to talk about what, they, what are their values and what, the, what they want to get. So uh, it's a good exercise with the family, with the company, or whatever is the context, uh, and they, where they declare what they want to uh, achieve. And I, and I think when, when that happens, it's a magic moment, because I think the things start happening. And a good example of, of that is me and my wife. <laughs> because we, when just start living together, we say, okay, let's go to do our holistic context. It's a pretty risky, you know, because it could be good or it could be bad. <laughs> so after that, we, we decide that we want to be, we care what's going on with the environment and with the farming. It's, that's one of the reasons because we are part of this. We, we declare that we want to be part of the solution so that's one reason because uh, we are part of this, the, we are savory, uh, savory to have because we want to have a biggest impact and we want to get the experience from other countries and give us, give our experience. And the third thing is that we declare is we want to live close to the, close to the natural, living in a farm with no chance at that moment, but after that we start working to try to get it. And now, from one year ago, we moved to our farm. We get a land from the, from the bank. And we are living there. And for me, it's my dream. And now she's pregnant. <laughs> so I think the holistic management helped the people to achieve what they want to do, what they're going to get. They helped the people to live uh, happy and improving the land. So I think it's something magic when you try to work with the people and with the nature and not against anything. So I think a very good example of holistic management is myself. <laughs> very good. Jorgen. Okay. Uh, I think all of us, we, we get a great deal of training in, in dealing with, with the skepticism in many ways. <clears throat> and, uh, and this little story is about that. We, uh, one of the first years when we were trying this, and people were very skeptical, and we took on the grazing of, uh, to, be, to be grazing with the heifers from a dairy, a dairy farm. So the heifers were sort of with us during the summertime, and then they come back in the, in the fall after the summertime of grazing. So the people who were working in the dairy, who has, he, did, he did not see the heifers during the summertime, so they just see them coming back in the fall. And they wouldn't say that, are these our heifers really? Are they, these, are, <laughs> these are way too big to be our heifers. <laughs> this is not normal. Uh, you, you put them on the, on the grazing land for the summertime and they won't be that much bigger as they come home. You make them big at home. So that was, one, that was a good, good example of that. There's something working in here. Very good. Thank yeah. you. So one of the reasons we wanted to engage in, in this conversation was to 
give you a little insight into that each one of the hubs that are being created are there's a personal connection to holistic management most and, and this may change in the future but for the most part people who are choosing to want to engage choosing to want to have these conversations in their local context are having them because they've personally been impacted and so it's great to hear some of the stories of what that personal impact if it's someone they've influenced or they themselves have been impacted so what was the reason uh, for all of you that made you decide instead of just doing it for myself I want to be involved in influencing and impacting other people. What, what was that change where you decided that it wasn't just about your farm or your ranch, it was about somebody else's farm and somebody else's ranch? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Yvonne. All right. Uh, well, there are many, many reasons, but I will uh, share to you uh, three that... Uh, for me, for the values that drive me, uh, remain the top ones uh, that maybe decide to uh, strengthen the bonds with, with this gang, with Alan and all these people. Uh, first of all, uh, to strengthen the role that uh, we had been already playing as a transformation business. Uh, why is it? Because even prior to the HAP strategy that launched, uh, that was launched by Daniela and Trey by the Institute, and therefore we now feel that we are creating synergy with all of you. Uh, the other one is, there's no doubt, to continue leading my family, uh, my immediate community to a, a long and everlasting learnful and practical journey. Uh, this framework indeed provides that path. And uh, the third one is to get to know landscapes and its peoples, our neighbors, uh, uh, our immediate cultures that surround our states, to travel, to learn, and to enjoy the beauty of creation. Thank you, Yvonne. Huggins. Yeah, in my case, in our case, uh, I want to start by reciting something that happened. We had a visit from the Deputy Minister of uh, Agriculture, uh, Paddington uh, Janda, and as he came in Dibangombe, he um, looked at our crop field. The crop field had a very good crop. And when we told him that there were no fertilizers involved, uh, but only animal impact, he could not believe it. But even then, when he went inside Dimaon and he looked at the, uh, our uh, pastures, uh, the grazing area, uh, he was so, so impressed. Now, this is what he, he said. He said, looking at the economy of Zimbabwe, I am very sure that livestock is going to turn around this economy. Mm. Uh, his arguments, he says, you only need one cow to buy so many bags of maize. And that is going to feed the rest of the family for the rest of the year. And therefore, he's bent on how can we do it together. Mm. Uh, so for us, one of the reasons why we're engaged is so that we influence change in government policy. Mm. And we are doing that with the minister, but not only are we wanting to target the Zimbabwe government, but we are also wanting the other governments that are in the Southern Africa region uh, uh, follow suit. Another reason is uh, just to network with uh, other institutions. Uh, the fact that there is a platform in the form of several institute, uh, we can gather, uh, uh, data and share it. Um, also training materials, we can share them easily. Um, and also facilitate uh, through this platform easy exchange of um, even visiting each other. Uh, so that's uh, so some of the things that we um, engage with, with, with in mind. And then last but not least, 
Um, for other hubs that are coming up, for us, we want to help them avoid some of the pitfalls <laughs> that we as the Africa Center have gone into. Uh, one of them being just building a big organization that would be at the expense of uh, a lot of effectiveness that you can do um, as you work on the, on the ground. So we've got lots of things to cushion and to help other institutions that are coming up uh, to be hubs. Yeah, those are some of the uh, reasons that we've got. Very good. Thank you. Jorgen. Uh, I know it, there is an, there's an African saying that I, I am because we are. And, and that has got to do with that. So there's no reason to try to fix things on your own unless people around you want to do it as well. And when it comes to this possibility of, of, of doing this, do, being a part of this work in, in a global <coughs> network, it's just so extremely powerful to know that, that these people are with, with us sort of as we work, th do things in Scandinavia or over there. It just, it just goes without saying, really. Very good. Thank you. Jose Manuel. <coughs> well, the, the reason because uh, we, we are part of this is well, we, the first thing is because, because we, we care what, what is going on in the uh, worldwide and in, in my country, in our country. So uh, we care and we commit with the, the problem. So, and, and it's very scary when there are so many problems, uh, you know, the global, uh, climate change, biodiversity loss and desertification, all the things that we are talking here. And, uh, and, and many other problems, and the people is just talking about the problems, and nobody and everyone is waiting for someone to fix it. I hope someone come to fix it. And it's, if every everyone in the world are waiting for someone to fix them, I mean, who will fix it? <laughs> so the only way is to try to convince to everyone to take one pro one problem and try to do something. Doesn't matter in which area. Could be in grass management. Could be in anything. So if anyone can do something, it's a worldwide movement. So I think we, we can have some hope. So I think these strategies could be helped to contact more people, to have a platform to, to share information, to, to have a bigger scale to try to convince. Because obviously, if we don't do it, if we are just waiting for someone watching TV, there's nothing going on. And, and we don't have too much time. You, Everyone say that it's very short because the degradation is, or the problems are going faster every moment. So uh, we need to do something. We need to be fast, and we need, I need help. Uh, and I want to be part of. I want to be a resource for the, all the rest too. That, that's the reason because we are in this. Thank you very much. So I'm going to ask you a question I didn't give you in advance. So here's a curveball for you all, uh, and and I want you to just think about something that would be genuine to everybody in the audience. It's managing ranches, managing organizations are complex. There are many challenges in that context. How do you deal with the frustrations and the challenges and the complexity? What, what, what are the ways that you have found to continue to address that in your context? Yvonne? Go for it, oh, yes. sure. Well, uh, let's go back to a uh, holistic management framework. Uh, it, for me, it's a fabulous way to organize my thought process mm. and to make decisions <coughs> according to a, an entity, a whole, that I have defined uh, with the company of those decision makers that are part of it by declaring a set of values uh, <laughs> under an order of composition of the assets under a perspective, holistic perspective, which now it's called a holistic context. And then, by learning that we all, everybody, Every citizen and living entity in the world. We're part of an ecosystem process. 
either cycling water, we all do it every day, nutrients, uh, and so on, by identifying that we do it with tools, those eight categories, and so on. For me, it's an authentic, orderly structure, framework to organize myself and everything and everyone that is around me. Thank you. Huggins. Yes. Uh, for, uh, for, for me, what is uh, uh, critical is, well, first, the magnetic uh, north that you refer to, which is a holistic uh, context. Um, but then we also need our management to be very smart. Uh, be able to test those uh, decisions uh, towards our uh, magnetic uh, north. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, some other things that we've learned, which are the uh, management guides, uh, for example, in um, uh, managing our finances, uh, I really even had advice for the upcoming uh, hubs to say, please, uh, we need to make that profit by generating it through cutting those costs. Uh, it's critical. And uh, we then uh, live within our means uh, as, as, um, as uh, we, we do it. So in, in short, we need our management to be effective. Very good. Yeah. Jose Manuel. <clears throat> well, you asked for the, how the, to do it to manage the complexity and the frustration. <laughs> so yeah, uh, obviously to manage the complexity is, is very tough, you know. Uh, but for our lack, there is a framework to try to deal with the complexity. So yeah, the, 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 the first thing in any organization is to have a north, you know, the holistic context. And after that, to check your decision up according to that. And in my case, because it's obviously this, we are trying to change minds, we are trying to convince people, and the people don't want to be convinced. So sometimes it's very frustrating. And yes, and, um, and I was just talking with someone at, at lunch, so with the big issue, and, and you see what we are a few people here try to talk about this, but there are so many people that it's not, it's not worried about that. So yes, yeah, sometimes it's very frustrating and, and very, yeah, I don't want to be, uh, we want to do something, but it's very hard to, so it's very easy to frustrate and try to see if it's, it's impossible. So. But what, what I'm trying to do in that when I feel very frustrated, I think what, one thing is to obviously to focus on what, what, the, what the things are going well. So, so many changes, we want, we want to have more, but still there are many people changing. And the other thing is, I think, is to connect with the nature. You know? I think one of the problems of our society now is because we are so disconnected. So in my case, go outside to walk in the grass, sit in the grass, touch the, the ground, and, and that kind of thing, with where the important things are, or where everything uh, grow. So that's helped me to get more energy to continue in this fight. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Jorgen. Um, responsibility seems to be a very scary thing. So. And it seems like we are normally, what we do uh, as, as individuals and together is we are sort of helping each other try to escape from it in various ways, try to look away, whatever, get away from that responsibility all the time. And, and if you do that a lot, then, then nothing, is, nothing is our sort of our problem. Other people have problems, but we are sort of, it's not our, our problem. So, so this holistic management uh, world, as it comes in, Really, uh, if, if we take that on, as we, if we make the choice to take that on, we can make the choice of taking more responsibility on. Mm. But, so that's it, uh, the frustrations and all those things. As long as, well, this is, it, it's easy to say like this, but if we could sort of take that on more together, because it is a tool of, the tool of taking on things together mm. like that. And then you sort of dare to see more the, 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 the responsibility possible to take on. So you can sort of dare to take a little bit more on and escape a little bit less. Uh, 
but it is frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> that, Very so good. Some, yeah. So just to give you guys visibility of the impact these and others have made, uh, I want everybody who is a part of a hub or is related to a hub to stand up right now. So the, the people you're, you're looking at beside you are just like the people that are sitting on the stage, just I couldn't get everybody up here, right? So I, I think they all deserve a, a round of applause. Thanks, guys. Part of the reason for giving you visibility is, and, and about what we're trying to do, if, if the Savory Institute's looking to partner with 100 different organizations over the next 10 to 12 years, uh, we are going to continue to need people to step up. And we wanted this to be an opportunity for you to get a little insight into the lives, into the people, into the organizations that are partnering with the Savory Institute globally and being able to do that and creating incredible impact. I mean, when you heard earlier from some of the others that are part of the Institute's network and these, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of hectares of land and millions of hectares of land. And, and that is no small feat. Uh, that is impacting land, impacting people's lives, and impacting communities in such a way that they will be transformed into the future. And so we were happy uh, in 2014 to have 90 uh, organizations asked to partner with the Savory Institute and we could only choose 10. And we are hoping to be able to choose more in the future, but in 2015 we'll choose another 10. And, uh, and maybe one of these days we can choose more, but the intent is to continue to partner with organizations locally to be able to offer uh, the education, the training, the services that these individuals are talking about here, others that you may be talking to in conversation, and have that as a means to be able to impact and support the implementation of regenerative land management in these places all over the world. So it, it's been incredible. Uh, as you can imagine, anybody who gets the privilege of getting to know these gentlemen and the others it's been phenomenal. I can't tell you how uh, amazing it's been to, to be on their lands, in their communities, being treated like family, engaging in things that truly will be life-changing to those around them. So, so one last question that you leave. For those here that have heard what you've said, uh, have been in other conversations, what would be the reason why you would encourage somebody who's thinking about it to become a part of this network, to become a part uh, of, of this family, uh, of this uh, Savory Hub a strategy? Huggins. Well, um, the world is full of uh, people that seem to be helpless in the face of uh, climate change and the effects of it, and uh, holistic um, land and livestock management will, will give the confidence for people to know that it is possible to deal with the effects and also to start reversing climate change. Thank you. Yeah. Jose Manuel. <clears throat> so I can, I don't know, I, I just can tell anyone that is thinking on this, have a round in your own context look the land, look the people, talk with the farmer, talk, uh, and, ask, and ask him what they think about the future. Most of them they will say that it's very common in the traditional farming. We are expecting for the rain, we are expecting for the prices, we are expecting for the new politics. You know, at the end, very depending, you know, from something. So, and then go to talk with someone that is practicing holistic management and maybe they will say, we are happy, we hope to increase the current capacity, the water cycle is going better, the, the biodiversity is going up. So you see people in, in, in Poera with power, you know, mm -hmm. power. So and then you see the difference, and, and if you care what's going on with the people that don't have that power, uh, if you care, join, join this. We need you, so that's... Jorgen. 
So I would say this is just an, it's, it's there to tap into this capacity to really sort of support and, and to coach your, your fellow farmers or your fellow entrepreneurs, or maybe even, even more so the future farmers, which may not come from the old farming community. This is such a, such a, a capacity to, to do something for them. So it's just, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yvonne, you have the last word. All right, thank you. <laughs> well, so there are so many dispossessed people out there that were part of the agrarian, agrarian world. And some that are very much possessed by established paradigms out there. Uh, I, I would suggest, recommend to all of you, dreaming of becoming a hub by simply applying yourself, stick yourself to what we're learning and teaching. This uh, fabulous framework to organize our thoughts and make congruent decisions. And uh, their respective strategic planning procedures. And as a Mexican proverb saying says, and it could be a universal proverb, words teach, examples draw, pull. Uh, so let's go for it. Become one. We all need you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. This is the first in most conferences, but uh, Chris, we're early, so you guys right. can sit. Yeah. Thank you. Namaste. Is this working? Okay. So now we have the, the complicated task of getting to our breakout rooms. And um, how we have that set up is on, on the back of your cards, you'll see there's, there's a color-coded map. So you have to find out which hub you want to go to, and then you can, you can find out where it is on the map. The, the best resource is actually the big wall, the jumbo screen out there because the actual schedule is color-coded to the, the rooms on the map. So um, it's a little confusing because if you thought, okay, I'm conversation track seven, that may not be in the room the same time twice. So just, just use the map out there. That's your best bet. Um, we're going to break until 3.30. There's going to be a track in here that runs the entire time. Um, that goes all the way through. And so there's two tracks that run all the way through. The rest, there will be a break in between, and you can go to either one. So uh, let's get started with that, and then we'll reconvene here afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>